Welcome to RV Talk Radio. Here we talk about RV living, RV lifestyles, and RV travel. We also celebrate the RV lifestyle that gives us the chance to do outdoor activities that we couldn't do in a normal lifestyle. So thanks for joining us. Grab yourself a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, and let's talk about RVs. Well, hello everyone. This is Rob from RV Talk Radio. This is episode 90. Glad we're here together. Lots of things going on. I, I, I am really pleased about how one of our last episodes did on the van dwelling. Uh, that turned out to be a really good show, and it was really a good feedback on that. Uh, I also wanted to uh, spend a little time talking about that and also talk about our return to Washington, some observations, uh, some things we saw with RVing, and lots to talk about. So let's get started. So the feedback we got on the uh, last show we did on episode 89, we talked about van dwelling and uh, uh, featured uh, cheap RV living done by a gentleman named Bob, I believe. And uh, I haven't had ever had a chance to talk to him personally, but it seems like a good-hearted guy. Uh, he did a show the other day where I kind of got the gist of his, why he became a van dweller. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a lot of people that have the uh, wonderlust, um, oh, I don't know, personality. And I can understand that because once you have it, it's hard to get rid of. So I find that, even with Sherry and I, we, you know, um, have explained that we've been full timers twice now, and um, we get torn because we enjoy uh, uh, living in a home too, and then we're also kind of dealing with that grandma grandpa thing, and and wanting to have a place for the kids to come, and um, really torn sometimes. But you always have that wanderlust once you've had the opportunity to travel. So I'm warning you now, <laughs> if you haven't been a traveler yet, and you're hemming and hawing about it. Uh, once you've done it, uh, it's hard to get out of your blood. And so it'll uh, terrorize you all the time because you always have that, oh, I've been sitting in one place too long. I'm, I want to do something. And so even when you own a home or um, apartment or something like that, uh, you'll constantly want to satisfy that feeling. So the other thing that was kind of interesting is, uh, you know, we brought up the fact that it was, Van dwelling. When I was looking at the root of it, uh, you know, it was people that were um, hit with some sad stories and some just you know uh, reasons of their own. Um, possibly fell onto hard times or um, got limited to uh, how much income they made per month and found that when they entered the RV world. And it wasn't just van dwelling. There's uh, also you know trailers and, and class C's and things like that, uh, where people found them very affordable and able to live their life as normal as possible and as happy as possible with the resources they have, and that's commendable. That's that's awesome. So that was a uh, kind of the feedback where we were getting on the show where people, a lot of people said, oh, "Okay, Rob, you finally get it." Um, yeah, I get that part. There's no doubt. Um, I uh, still uh, <laughs> have a little problem with the ones that go out. And it's not because of the means uh, or the resources are weak. It's because they uh, want freedom from society. <laughs> and um, that's, I mean, I can understand that part. And yeah, it's really good to kind of have the opportunity to go see the world and stuff like that. But I really wish I could find out more about what they're sacrificing to do what they do. Um, uh, are their careers, their resumes, their households, their families, their kids? Uh, what sacrifices are really being uh, taken? You know, happening there that we don't see because these are shows. Remember, and and. and so just like when you watch you know, Sherry and I and our shows and stuff, um, you don't see, you know five minutes of our life put in a video, you don't see the turmoil or your, or uh, uh, the cost of something where we had to pay for fix fix something or um, or an argument about 
where we parked or how we did something you know it's there's a life behind these videos and so how many of these people are don't have health insurance uh, are not paying taxes properly or not if they're um, not paying taxes properly are they getting social security paying into that and 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 contributing to their future and are they setting up any kind of savings programs or are they just living paycheck to paycheck and are they uh, really just have the intention of trying to find a way to suck money from us to support their hobby or their lifestyle I get concerned about that and you know I've, I've uh, <laughs> spoke on that subject a lot but anyway um, good feedback on the last sh uh, show uh, I learned a lot uh, thanks to uh, uh, that particular channel I was talking about uh, I still um, skeptical about what you're really seeing about some of these other freedom loving people that um, uh, you're not seeing the the times of uh, you know uh, problems with the RV or power situations or uh, um, uh, some of these RV parks can be kind of a pain in the neck to be in and waiting to get into a campground and only being able to stay in one place for 14 days and constantly having to move and and everything and that surrounds you you don't own except maybe your RV and uh, those are the things they don't talk about and that's because <laughs> they don't want to and so once again you know we always focus on the lifestyle so if you ch are to choose this lifestyle you need to know at least have somebody in your courts telling you all the things to be aware of and uh, uh, obviously Sharon and I have done it uh, a few times so those sometimes are okay I mean they're uh, uh, just kind of know it's going to be that way so yeah anyway I want to move on and kind of tell you a little bit about our return trip to Washington uh, if you're watching any uh, outdoor travel channels uh, videos uh, you'll notice we you know we put them out in series so right now you probably think we haven't even got there yet but uh, we're actually completed the mission already and uh, so the shows will come out every Tuesday and Thursday and uh, I think there's already up to part eight and uh, I think the last show we programmed was like August uh, 18th so there um, and there's still editing the shows it was a oh man we did a lot of filming but anyway, so let's uh, move on to that subject, returning to Washington and some of the observations. So yeah, we uh, pretty much, I, you know, I was gone for about two weeks. Uh, and you probably noticed we didn't get an episode out last week. I kind of warned you that might be a problem. And the reason I kind of do that is because all of our sound systems, you know, if you see podcasts, you'll notice people have mixers and really good microphones and things like that. And uh, so once you get that kind of intricate system set up, um, it makes you not really want to do a, uh, a show that the recording um, may not be as clear or as nice or the microphone uh, doesn't work as, as good as you'd like it to. And then people get upset about the, the audio quality. So uh, anyway, so I've kind of found it's better if it is not too long to actually just skip a week for an episode. and. And wait uh, so we can at least give you a good quality recording so anyway um, uh, for those of you who are starting to watch the videos and things like that Sherry and I returned to Washington uh, because of an opportunity a couple of them one is we had some friends uh, uh, going up to Washington uh, they're gone for six months basically or five months and they actually started from here in Arizona and wanted to go see the Northwest and so it was kind of a neat opportunity because we've become really good friends of a um, to uh, once we kind of chatted I said you know we could actually meet you up there and we can make some adjustments to our Sunbird situation that we have up there and we you know we originally came from Washington we still had stuff stored up there and so uh, how frustrating is that when you know, one is I'm paying storage for the RV up there and I'm paying storage for stuff up there stuff there that stuff and believe me I went from a minimalist to a whole bunch of junk again and so uh, not real proud of that I've got a full garage now of two full bedrooms of just stuff and 
uh, you know, it's funny. I mean, we lived without all that stuff for a long time, and now it's here. And I can't even find, we can't even find enough time to go through it to thin it out. It's like, how frustrating is that? It's going to take us a half a year or better to get through the stuff we brought from Washington. So anyway, so we got up to Washington. Uh, we wanted to go up to Washington, meet our friends, and we had the opportunity to move the RV farther south to central Oregon and keep it on Sherry's uh, folks' place um, for no cost. And we kind of have some family reasons for that. One is we really enjoy central Oregon. Two, no cost. <laughs> Three is Sherry's folks are uh, getting up there in age and stuff, and we are, are kind of uh, uh, considered um, uh, executors of things and stuff like that. And we kind of want to be available to them if something was to happen. And uh, we pray that nothing ever does, but now we're totally set up where we could do this, be right up in Central Oregon, have a place to stay, and, and could be there for long term for uh, per, you know, purposes of health or supporting her, her folks. And so that was pretty important to us. So you probably don't pick up all that in the videos, but um, there's actually a family reason and a financial reason to move the RV to Central Oregon and Sunbird up there. Um, we really enjoy Central Oregon. We lived there for over 10 years or so. So um, uh, it's not a place that works. It was great when we had our kids there, but it's not now that uh, you know we had big property and a little farm and all that stuff back in the day. But that was you know we were enjoying that with young teenagers and stuff. And now they're all gone and grown up. Um, it was time for a different lifestyle. But anyway. So we got rid of that, and uh, um, Todd, which was one of the, um, Todd and Lane are the people we met with their two teenagers, um, volunteered to help uh, load the truck if we were able to get a truck. So um, the other thing you'll see in the video is we got a 16-foot truck. So I may have brought this up in the other show, maybe I haven't, but if you need to buy or rent a moving truck, you'll find them to be quite expensive depending where you're at. So here's what we learned. If you're going to rent a rental truck to move things, and you let's say I'm just going to use um, it's going to cost you a thousand dollars for a 16 foot truck, because of the population and the um, uh, and uh, it's all statistics. This is like insurance companies. Anyway, um, so Sherry started doing a little homework and talked to some of the uh, offices, and he says, "Oh yeah, you can get your trucks." Because uh, we're complaining, it's like, man, these prices seem so high. And he goes, well, that's because it's summer and everybody's moving and it's really popular right now to go from the northwest to Phoenix area. And so that's where it'll nail you. However, if you get your truck in a uh, less popular area, you'll find significant savings. So Sherry started to do a little homework. And sure and heck, I mean, not only significant, 50% difference. So we got a 16-foot truck for 500 and some like change. Uh, as opposed to what we were seeing in the Seattle, uh, Bellingham area, and, and Washington, uh, over a thousand dollars, twelve hundred or better, even. So sometimes it was even better than a fifty percent savings. So keep that in mind. So yeah, we had some inconvenience. We actually had to take a ferry, go across to the Olympic Peninsula over to Paulsbo, and that's where we got our truck. And we had to bring it back on a ferry, which was a little more expensive than a car, but still the significant savings. So in fact, we got our sixteen-foot truck cheaper than we did the largest trailer that U-Haul ha uh, has. We paid five hundred and some odd for that. So uh, anyway, um, it was a, quite a significant saving. So keep that in mind when you're moving or, or, or moving, uh, uh, or maybe you're full-time traveling and maybe settling down later and you have stuff in storage. Uh, ho I really hope that helps you save some money and or uh, when you're renting trucks. And uh, yeah, so anyway, lesson learned there. The next thing we noticed is when we got up there, you know, the RV was in storage. Um, RV was in great shape, had no problems, just ran in there, uh, hooked it up, took it over to the RV park, just like I was anticipating a Sunbird lifestyle would be like. And um, everything worked really well, didn't seem to have any issues whatsoever. And it was only like a, two, a one month stay up there, but. Um, uh, I was concerned it was already and so in the summer we winterized it because we didn't think we'd get back there in case we didn't get back there at all in the fall or winter so uh, we ended up 
winterizing it again when we uh, took it from Washington down to Central Oregon. And uh, I can guarantee you that, that they'll get some hard freezes there. And uh, But we don't know if we'll be back there in the fall or not. But uh, um, anyway, so it's all winterized, so we had to go through all that procedure. So one of the main things I've never had a chance to really do before is pull the drain on the hot water tank and you know, if you pull that out I think that's a zinc fitting they have in there that helps you know with corrosive waters and boy that thing looked terrible so the next time I go up there I'm going to replace that with a new one because it was uh, it was doing its job it was um but uh, uh our hot water tank in our Montana is a 12 gallon tank and it's really served us well you know we lived in that full time for the last time 18 months and uh uh we we have not had any trouble with that water tank but um uh, i didn't want to put antifreeze in that water tank uh, but i did last time because i couldn't get the bolt off but of course you know it goes to sherry's father's place he's got every tool in the world and that's how we got it open so we uh, went through the procedures of winterizing the rv um step by step and did it properly and uh and actually did the hot water tank the way we wanted to we actually drained it and uh, didn't uh, put uh, antifreeze in that. So anyway, it's not harmful or anything, but it's uh, really frustrating when you put antifreeze in your hot water tank. It takes a long time to get it washed out. And uh, of course, when we came up there, we were boondocking right right away, so we couldn't flush anything uh, because you need the water. And uh, the other thing that was kind of cool about the storage place that we had, the RV place, is they actually had a water fill-up area in there. So I was able to, you know, tanks were completely empty. And so I was able to fill up the tank to the max and just drive it my five miles to the place where we were keeping it. I don't like to pull a, a, a trailer with a full tank of water. That's a lot of weight. But for short dis distances, you, just, you don't have a choice. And so most boondockers know that. But... Uh, if you're doing a long haul and uh, you're hitting bumpy roads and things like that, that's a lot of stress on the on the uh, you know anybody's water tank and all the fittings that hold that. So anyway, RV worked really well, had absolutely no problems, and uh, I gotta tell you, I'm still very happy with our Montana. Um, once again, it's a 2013 RE uh, Rear Entertainment System, 3625. Um, it's just uh it, it's a gem and uh since we you know we put the new tires on it since the tire blew, blew out and back there uh, two years ago at uh las vegas i can't believe it's been two years already anyway um put really good yakahama's tires on it and so i don't worry about that anymore it's good tough tires they're a little bit bigger than the regular uh, trailer tires but fit just fine and uh, uh when you're hauling i tell you when you get down here uh, if you have bad tires or weak tires, you're going to find out real quick because this hot weather is really tough on them. So anyway, um, one of the other things I wanted to bring up is what happened to us when we got home. As many of you guys know, as, uh, when you live in Arizona in the summer, we have what's called the monsoon season, which is a spectacle where just out of the blue, uh, weather starts coming through and uh, you'll have these torrential rains and, and lightning and, and thunder come through and then it'll go by and for you know it's a nice sunny day again anyway so there, we knew there was a lot of monsoons going through our neighborhood while we were gone because we still monitored the and plus we get the alerts and anyway so <laughs> we come home and one of the two things two major things happen one is we found out sherry's car which is a mazda 3 we've had for about five years very little mileage on it has the original battery in it and if we when and kind of getting back to what i was talking about earlier when you come down here in the hot weather if you have weak tires or weak batteries uh this hot weather will let you know really quick and of course sherry's car barely started so right off the bat we had to go get a new battery for her car you just don't mess around with it because she was lucky she was even able to start it because I've had the batteries absolutely die in my truck and it's like they die they're gone and it's instant it's just and so you don't want to fiddle around with it so there was 150 bucks down the, you know down the tube so we get home and it's a monsoon on the way and thank god we got home just before the monsoon came because driving in a monsoon is a real pain and sherry was driving the uh, 
a rental truck and I was driving a regular truck and the reason being sure he actually enjoyed driving the, driving the truck so that's why she drove it anyway so um, she liked liked that truck better than driving my truck which I don't know oh, but she was happy anyway so we go in the backyard and lo and behold our 14 foot Serrero cactus fell over on our outdoor patio furniture crushed it and glass everywhere and um, I guess I'm kind of glad I didn't go against the concrete walls or anything that you know, with the neighbors and all that but oh my gosh so uh, if for anybody knows anything about Arizona what is uh I don't know if you noticed uh, but cactuses have little pointy things all over it <laughs> it's not like something you can just grab and move around like a log um, some of the other problems you got is uh, Serrero cactuses are protected. So you just don't do anything you want with a Serrero cactus. So it was one of those like, dang, you know, if you want to fix it. And, you, and then when we start doing the homework, it, it could cost a lot of money. And, and there's these stories of it costing, you know, a thousand dollars to move these things because they weigh a ton because they're full of water. They are absolutely heavy. And uh, so you hear all these nightmares of uh, how much it costs to get these moves. So Sherry and I are like freaking out because, damn, we just got hit with the batteries when we got home. We just had to unload a truck. Uh, and uh, by the way, we didn't have to unload the truck because we, <laughs> we hired two men and a truck people to come over. And actually, they unloaded the truck in less than 45 minutes and they charged me like 210 bucks which was worth it to me and Sherry because it was like really hot and humid because of the monsoon that just went through the day before. And uh, so that was a lifesaver. And so there was another 210 that we spent when we just get home. And now we got this Sororo in our backyard. Uh, I mean, we didn't have to be in a hurry and stuff, but we also, you know, if the grandkids come over, if we have cinder outside, we worry about the animals and stuff um, with that Sororo. And so one of the judgments was is we we're going to try to save the sorrow. And the reason being is when we ha uh, moved here, the biggest worry I, w I always have in our backyard is either our grandson running into the sorrow, which <laughs> will hurt big time, or Cinder uh, getting hurt by it, uh, just not paying attention, chasing after a ball or something. And uh, not that there isn't other plants in our yard that won't kind of catch your attention, but the sorrow... Is like one big deadly weapon and so we decided we didn't want to keep it so here's what we learned about Sierra cactuses in Arizona if you're transporting changing uh, replanting moving a, a live Sierra from one point to another you must have a permit to do so if a Sierra falls on your property private property you can remove it without a re permit but you must cut it up uh, and dispose of it. You can't. You cannot move it as a whole Sorero. Um, and, uh, and and by the way, they say even if a Sorero gets a little slash or, or bruise or something on the side of it, it was literally kind of bleed to death. So uh, even if it was healthy and then it fell over and it damaged wherever it fell on, it put a gash in that Sorero, it would probably die anyway. So you can kind of see why we decided, well, first it's down, two is we don't want to transport it, and three, uh, uh, it was kind of a danger to our pets and our grandkids. So uh, I'm sitting in my office <laughs> and editing video, and I hear a chainsaw, right? So I go running out in the front yard to see what it is, and it turns out that the since we're new in the neighborhood, we don't have a landscaper, and a lot of people use have landscaping people come in and trim up all their stuff because the plants here are a little different than a standard front yard. So anyway, um, so the next door neighbors got their landscaping people there. There's like three guys. Um, I'll uh, go over there, and I, I I said, "Hey, how's it going?" And they introduce a really nice people, and uh, I said, "By the way, do you can you?" Uh, uh, cut up or move a sorrel cactus for us and he goes well you know show it to me so i brought him over to the house went to the backyard and he goes looks it over real close and he goes uh we can do it today i i can do it for 
$140. <laughs> it's like, yes! <laughs> For what all the research I've been doing on Sarah cactuses, uh, yeah, I will be happy to pay $140. And, uh, and then the other thing is why they're there is three of them, right? So uh, I, said, um, I said, I'll tell you what, I'll add another $20 of that if you guys will help me put my canopy back in my truck. So I actually paid 160 and because uh, uh, it's once again really hot and sure and I can get the canopy on the truck but it was so much nicer it was three guys already with me being a fourth we were able to get that canopy on in like seconds so it was a well spent 20 bucks so anyway um, but anyway so those guys said they'll cut it up and you can look in a, a outdoor travel channel you'll see that we created a video of how the whole thing happened in the first place and you can actually see how they cut that Sorero uh, cactus up and disposed of it. And boy, let me tell you, that's a deadly thing. Because even when you're using a chainsaw and stuff, you get one of those little prickly things uh, uh, on the outside. It can shoot out and shoot, <laughs> hurt somebody. And so they had to treat it like they were like cutting up a rattlesnake. So yeah, it was really amazing to watch. It was kind of a lot of stress, but we were able to actually dispose of the whole Sorero cactus by getting it cut up for $140 basically and so we're pretty happy with that of course that all happened in the same week so as soon as we're home we're dishing out like $500 worth of you know uh, just being gone for a little bit it seemed like uh, we were getting kind of overwhelmed with with uh, little issues so I don't know uh, uh, but it made for a great video So getting back a little bit to the uh, RV lifestyle and world like that, so I, um, I went off of my Sorero story there, but one of the things that was really neat was rediscovering the RV again. And so here's the deal. When you're living in your RV full time, pretty soon it's your whole life and you live in this little you know, 400, or it's actually more a square foot place. Uh, the walls start feeling like they're creeping up on you and it's getting confining. And when you're in Arizona the summer, when it gets really hot, it's really uh, hard to go outside. So you're just kind of, and you put those shades on your windows to protect from, uh, insulate the windows from the heat. And you're living in a really deep, dark cave. Uh, you start going insane uh, if you're not traveling a lot. So uh, uh, in our case, we had to hold still. And... Uh, Last summer, it's probably why you know saw so many videos of us going to Texas and buying a boat and going to Washington to pick up the boat and going to Lake Powell a lot, is because it's just so hot. You want to find a way to, to escape it. But uh, anyway, so you get kind of tired and sick and tired of your RV and you're just kind of like, oh man. And then so that's probably why one of the urges of why Sherry and I wanted to get it back into a house because we just. Um, you know, we knew we were going to be in Arizona for a long time, and um, anyway, so having the space, not feeling so confined during the summer, which that's what it is right now, um, and you still feel it even in the big house. Uh, you walk in your backyard and go, "Gosh, I can't even stand to be in my backyard." Uh, evenings are great, uh, especially uh, that's when it's really nice to use the swimming pool. And Cinder loves the swimming pool too. But sw even you know, your pets can't really go outside much. Uh, um, just it's so hot, but and it's only for like three months. But it seems like an eternity. It's like it's like winter time. He's just like, will will the snow go away? So anyway, so re rediscovering the RV when you haven't used it for a while, it felt so nice to be back into the RV. Uh, it was like home sweet home, but it was kind of a nice feeling knowing that you didn't have to be in it all the time. So it's so neat is we pick up the RV, we uh, put it in a spot, pull the slides, and automatically it's like, ah, oh, it's our nice, comforty um, RV that we love so much. I, I think what's kind of nice about it is it almost made us fall in love with our RV again. You know, we were actually getting to a point of thinking, maybe it's time to get rid of it and maybe we'll just get some little, you know, little thing. But uh, I got to tell you, when we got up to Washington and pulled it out and opened up and everything's familiar and all the systems worked, and I, I do want to talk about my power systems a little bit, um, it was just great and it performed perfectly. And 
We know all the ins and outs of our RV. It was like home sweet home. Um, the, the good part was knowing that you didn't have to live in it permanently. The sad part was, you know, only being in it for six days, seven days. Um, we're getting, you know, it's like not long enough. So it was a love-hate kind of thing. As we loved being back in it and hated the fact we had to go home and leave it. Because uh, uh, the RV has always brought us such pleasure and comfort. Uh, we have it set up so nicely, a really nice bed, mattress in there. We sleep good in it. When the weather's cool, it's just so nice to be in the RV and get up in the morning and make a cup of coffee and swing that door open and and uh, enjoy nature and the whole works. Uh, it was definitely nice to be back in our RV. And it'll be nice the next time we're in it next time. Um, the one thing I wanted to talk about was how we handled boondocking once again. Now here's the deal on how we set up our, our RV. I think it's practical. Now, a lot of people go nuts with all this solar stuff and I'm not against solar but I'm actually against overdoing it because so many people are trying to run so you know systems that are really designed for 110 to get it to work on inverters and batteries and, and, and solar when they're uh, boondocking and my answer to that is turn on the generator. <laughs> It's like, oh yeah, that's too easy. You know, it's like, it's cheaper. Turn on the generator. So the way we set up our RVs, we have an 85 watt solar panel on the top. And you go, really, that's all? Yep. And we have a controller. And also I had installed an inverter system in the RV that goes to the back of the RV, which uh, um, it, I just had a outlet put in. Um, and so when we are boondocking, if we want to watch television and watch a movie, we move our power cord from the regular outlet to the inverter outlet and turn on the inverter and we can watch movies or watch TV. So the only time I need that kind of power is, and also that is, you know, we're not watching TV or that. It also gives us the power we need to charge any of our uh, cameras or cell phones and so that's how we deal with the 110 that we need when we're boondocking now when I need to make coffee if I need to make a, a use the microwave or uh, something like that or sure he needs a dryer hair all that we fire up the generator we have a nice quiet 5500 uh, generator in our RV works wonderful and uh, charges up our you know so we have a monitor and we can see how well uh, by the way my uh, I got up to 3.5 uh, amps of charging on that little 85 watt thing I was really amazed anyway it, during the day um, I, I got this constant trickle charge on the batteries so at night when we put a little pressure on it watching TV or something I'll fire up the generator for about a half hour brings them up to almost a hundred percent Next morning, um, I'll fire up the generator because I want to have coffee anyway um, and kind of uh, get everything up to 100% within half hour or so. And I'm set to go. That's our process. And uh, uh, having a very uh, quiet generator uh, is definitely uh, I recommend. But we uh, did great. Now, our friends who are up there, they get this big integrated system. they got like three 200-watt panels. Uh, they've been traveling for a while. They've had trouble with it. Uh, something went wrong with the controller. Um, actually, uh, they didn't get a really couldn't. Uh, uh, I mean, we just had a nice, smooth operation going on with our system. No problems. And uh, just a push of a button and fired up the generator when you're usually boondocking. Once everybody's a little bit more um, open minded, knowing that generators are going to come on. And so it wasn't just, you know, uh, us two in our RVs, even the motorhomes and stuff that were boondocking, we're firing up the generators. Understandable, nobody gets upset with each other as long as everybody runs on a, re a regular, you know, uh, normal times of day, uh, not late at night or too early in the morning. And uh, so, yeah, we were very happy with that very system, um, simple system of, a, and, and, the other reason I wanted the 85 watt thing is I have it at the Montana's you can switch off the power like a big circuit breaker it shuts off everything and uh, so you, whatever you might have on it might um, cause a little bit of a um, 
pressure on your batteries and so you store your RV for a month or two and come and find out dead batteries and that's a pain in the butt. I had it bypassed so my little 85 watt solar is charging and keeping my batteries at 100% all the time even when it's in storage and I have the power shut down on the whole RV. Um, and uh, so it's so sweet you just hook up the RV and it's been in storage I check my batteries are 100 percent it's like hoo 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 and I by battery wise I only have two six volt batteries I put brand new ones in before we went full timing um, they're performing just fine um, I'll let you know next year <laughs> if I have any trouble with those two batteries but uh, that's all I got in there and and Sherry and I can live in the RV very comfortably and so uh, as far as uh, the refrigerator and the hot water tank there I, we switched the propane that uh, don't have any trouble heating so everything is propane driven and uh, yeah you burn more propane and stuff but it's better than trying to deal with all those issues of having all those panels and stuff and I, I just try it just it doesn't seem safe and it seems like such an overkill to put all those batteries and all those solar systems in just so you can run your microwave uh, or you can just flip a switch turn on the generator run the microwave and then shut off the generator just that simple uh, anyway um, money wise you could look at you know a generator what five thousand dollars for a good one um, as opposed to maybe five thousand dollars in <laughs> And controllers and and batteries and solar panels and all that stuff uh, you know you have to weigh it out so that was my observation of how boondocking went I was very happy with the design that Sherry and I have simple easy to use and practical and uh, uh, of course you know we don't boondock I mean we've done up to a week in boondocking still been happy that I get more um, frustrated when you go you know use up all your water and then you gotta pack up the RV and all that stuff and go to a place to refill your tanks and dump your tanks and go back to where you want to go we can last about three to four days uh, before we use up all of our water and we could probably do better if we wanted to but if we know that we're gonna move in three days uh, we don't have to be that conservative so uh, and that's how long we boondocked when we first got there was three days so it was great because then we we're going to an RV park didn't have to worry about tanks or anything until we got to the RV park and dumped everything there and actually had a chance to flush everything and uh, yeah it worked out really good so that's what we do for boondocking uh, the other thing is the Wi-Fi Ranger once again worked really well for us uh, especially in Central Oregon Sherry's father you know uh, we stay in a five acre place he has good internet um, and so but it, when I'm out in his property we're a little bit far from the house we can't tap into his wireless but when I have Wi-Fi Ranger on our internet works great way back there so because we get about an acre and a half away from the house and uh, the Wi-Fi Ranger picks up his signal just great and we have internet on there and um, we also uh, when we're at the marina up in Anacortes uh, the marina offers free Wi-Fi once we get the password to that we're able to tap into that with the Wi-Fi Ranger so yeah um, so those are the two main systems we have for boondocking worked really well I personally think that's a you know, nice and simple and common sense way to do boondocking if you're only doing boondocking once in a while I truly understand why you know the other people want to go all out and be able to run try to run an air conditioner and stuff like that on on, a, on their um, solar power because you can't run the generator all day long so if you're trying to boondock in warm weather and don't have an air conditioner your RV can become an oven so that's where I can see where they're trying to build up these battery systems and, and charging systems to be able to keep cool um, I guess uh, the best thing I can say is try not to boondock in the warmer weathers um, easier said than done I imagine especially if you're trying to save money uh, and uh, yeah but that's how we handled it I hope uh, that's helpful to you for your systems uh, but yeah simple solar system simple 1000 watt um, inverter is what we have works great to power up our television and watch a, a movie if we want to at night and keep charging all of our uh, uh, camera batteries and, and cell phones worked out really good so yeah move on 
So here's another thing I want to brag about or talk about or, uh, or I don't talk about it that much, but I want to talk about my truck. And so uh, for some of you who follow this for a while, you know what I have. I have a 2002 Ford F-350 Lariat one ton dually uh, with you know, the club cab. It's a monster, but it's only two wheel drive. And I got a. T and what's unique about it is it's the last of the 7.3 liter diesel engine that uh, Ford put in their truck. So, what I want to talk about is if you have an opportunity to get a hold of one of those trucks, and I believe 2002 was the last year that they put the 7.3s in there. So, if you come across a truck that has less than 200,000 miles on it, that's a diesel that has a 7.3 and it looks like a good looking truck and just needs to be you know some tender loving care it's worth every penny so I think I'm up to 210,000 miles I don't even know if the check engine light works and I keep watching all these shows like Freedom Theory and some of these other guys and they're constantly uh, check engine light and their trucks in the shop again and uh, and it's not just one channel I see it in several all these new trucks with the new def systems and all that um, it seems like they're constantly uh, playing havoc on people pulling their rigs. Now I'm sure there's exceptions to the case, but uh, I've I just keep driving my truck and realizing some people says well, you're going to get three hundred, four hundred thousand miles out of it, and I'm thinking, no way! I've never had cars feel like they could do that, but my truck still feels as solid today as when I first bought it. Yes, I've had some minor things where I've had the, uh, definitely, you know, you go through tires and you definitely, um, I had to change out, um, I've had some little, little, little things happen to it, um, but wow, what a, what a great truck it's been and it's served me so well. Of course, that's a knock on wood kind of thing, but I just, I, I just want to put it out there that the Ford, the Ford F-350 I don't know if they put in the other size of truck with the 7.3 liter diesel uh, older trucks and if you're looking for a used truck and you come across one of those that's a gem <laughs> I'm telling you uh, and I have been told time and time again never to sell my truck and and I the more I watch some of these RV channels and stuff the more I'm convinced they're absolutely right um, I have to be completely certain that I don't want that truck anymore because my truck, I, I constantly am pulling stuff with it. If it isn't a fifth wheel, I'm pulling a, a U-Haul trailer. And then if you ever notice, we have a pretty good sized boat that we uh, tow with that thing. And throughout the years, I've had that truck since 2005. And I, I bought it with 10,000 miles on it. And I paid like 36,000 for it at the time. Seemed like a lot, but... Now a truck like mine's like seventy five thousand dollars loaded with all the goodies on it. Anyway, um, what a gem and what a workhorse! And, uh, and you may not know this, but a full wheel drive has ten thousand uh, pound less towing capacity than a two wheel drive. And if you don't believe me, go look up the specs. Um, so uh, uh, I'm sure some people say, well, "Why'd you get a two wheel drive?" Um, well, one is it has a higher towing capacity, and I needed that when I bought my first uh, Montana back in the day. I think I had a 34 foot back then, and uh, I needed a truck. And I just, I had a guy in Enumclaw, Washington, that always took good care of me and Sherry for years. And I told him I needed a good truck. And he goes, You need to get in here now to see this one truck that just got traded in. Um, it was a sad story. Someone bought that truck new. Uh, they went traveling. It lasted a short time. The wife passed away and didn't have any reason to keep it anymore. So that's how I was able to get that truck at such an affordable price. Fully set up and it does have exhaust brakes on it too. Uh, just been a great truck. Is it, you know, is, is it, it could use uh, some new furniture inside of it. The steering wheel looks kind of scruffy. All that stuff. All in all, it's a rock solid truck. I don't even have a dent in it. Um, we've just and and I've always been taught, by the way, and this is wisdom from my father: treat your truck like a Cadillac. And back in the day, Cadillacs were the thing. 
and drive it like one. Take your, you know, take your turns slow and easy, and drive it like a, like a limo. And uh, the, your truck will last forever. And I, I really believe that, and I think I've proven it. Uh, I usually only keep a truck for ten years. I'm well beyond ten years already. Um, just um, very happy with it. So once again, uh, if you come across a used dually or use Ford. I, I, I think they're, it's not just the Dooleys. They have the 7.3 liter diesel engine and it's in pretty good shape and the price looks fairly reasonable. You probably find that the price, if the guy knows what he's got, you'll probably see that the um, price is a little higher than other used rigs. That's why it's a good investment. It'll be a truck that'll last for, you know a long time for you. Yes, uh, some of the little things on the you know beyond the engine might need repair or replaced, um, which is normal wear and tear. But that diesel is one heck of an engine, and it's served me well. And I just did three thousand miles, well more than three thousand miles, twice this summer in that truck, and it performed wonderful. So yeah. Um, I would be really nervous about doing those trips with any other truck um, in it that has over 200,000 miles on it. So, especially going through the desert, the last thing you want to be is stranded in the middle of a desert. So anyway, there's a recommendation for you. Um, <laughs> that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Well, we're getting to the end of the show here. This has been episode 90. I uh, talked about the return to Washington and... Uh, uh, once again, I love all the feedback we got from the van dwellers. <laughs> Some of them said, okay, Rob, you finally get it, um, <laughs> but you're still cranky. <laughs> anyway, um, talked about our uh, uh, our truck. I hope uh, that helped. If you're ever shopping for a used truck, look for those 7.3 liters diesels. Anyway, I want to thank everybody for uh, listening to our show. Uh, hopefully, we'll be back in a regular schedule here. Uh, in two weeks, we're getting ready to launch the boat into Lake Sorero, I think we're going to do down here. Uh, just because the summer is getting so late. I don't know what, you know, each month I keep thinking we're going to launch that thing. But anyway, uh, just been busy. But yeah, I, I think some of the other things I want to talk about in the future is about minimalism and how Sherry and I are going to deal with it once again. And uh, um, some of the other things going on in the RV world. So anyway, right, thanks for listening. Uh, please be safe and don't forget to subscribe and we'll talk to you next week. Bye now.